Hi Hi everyone. everyone. Welcome to Lifehouse Community Church Online. We're so pleased that you're connecting with us and you've joined us to watch uh, and partake in this service. My name is Mark and this is Catherine and we're pastors of the church. Um, It's coming up to Easter week. Have you had your Easter egg? No, not yet. Not yet, me neither. I had a mini one. Uh, Yeah, I had some mini eggs. Um, Have you had your Easter egg yet? Have you bought them? Have you eaten them? Um, Or hot crust buns, those sorts of things. We're coming into that sort of season. Um, This week uh, we are entering into one of the most important weeks um, that we remember and celebrate. Yeah, this is when we kind of all start from this build up of kind of Jesus kind of riding on a donkey into reduce them and then the whole crowds are cheering and it goes very quickly into him being put to death on the cross. And then, kids, we've been journeying through the Easter story the last couple of weeks. Mm. And today on the newsletter has been sent out this week's journey um, for you to continue learning more about that story. Yeah, so ask your uh, ask your adults um, for the activities. They're all on the newsletter. To get the newsletter, you go to the website. Can you remember it? No, I can never remember uh, it. <laughs> Lifehousecommunitychurch.co.uk forward slash contact. Um, ask to get our newsletter and we'll add you on it if you're not getting it already. Um, that You can find out other things in there, um, such as our youth. We do youth online at the moment. Um, on Good Friday, um, we're going to be breaking bread and praying together on Zoom at 8pm. The details again in the newsletter. Um, and Yeah, there's also the daily readings on there. If you're not watching them on social medias like Instagram and YouTube and Facebook, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so many. Have I forgotten one? I don't think I've forgotten any. But if you can't get access to those, they're also in the newsletter. Yeah. So they're on our social media channels. They'll have popped up. Instagram, Twitter, and um, they're everywhere. Facebook. And on the YouTube channel. They're everywhere. Um, not quite. Um, and then, so next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Um, we're going to be on YouTube. Um, we're going to have an all-age service. Um, we're going to celebrate that he has risen. Um, we're going to have fun and there's going to be various different parts of it. So do um, join us for that uh, um, next Sunday. Yeah. Now we're going to watch um, from the Bible Society a short kind of spoken word clip just to build, set the scene for today. You're the Christ. He asked us who he said he was. That's what he said. You're the Christ. You know he rode a donkey into Jerusalem, right? People laying down a procession of palm leaves for the one we'd all been waiting for. It was like one of those pinch me moments. Then Passover came. Me and the boys are tucking into the flatbread and Jesus just comes out with it. One of you dipping bread in the balsamic's gonna turn me in, he said. Then he takes the bread tears and shares it. What are you waiting for? Tuck in, he said. This is my body, broken, beaten, bruised, for you. Then he gives thanks and passes round the red. Drink up, he said. This is my blood, poured out for plenty. A bit later, we're up the Mount of Olives with Jesus. You know, when push comes to shove, you're all going to bail on me, he said. No chance, I said. The rest of them might. I'm not going anywhere, I said. Count on it, he said. Before the night's over, you'll swear blind you don't even know me, he said. On my life, I'll never deny you. I'll die for you, I said. It all happened so fast. One minute, we're with Jesus as he's praying up Gethsemane and we're sparked out unconscious the next. They've got Jesus in handcuffs. And all they can remember is what he said. That we'll bail on him. That we'll deny him. That I'll deny him. I'm not having it, I thought. He's got it wrong, I thought. So I drew out my sword. I gripped my teeth and I let rip. I cut this guy's ear clean off. Come on, let's have it. Enough, Jesus said. As he just goes quietly and I just legged it. I tailed him till we ended up at the chief priest's place. Me, in the courtyard, outside by the fire, him, inside, standing trial. (laughs) Trial. Witnesses fabricating fake news, trying to pin something on Jesus that would land a death penalty. 
You got nothing to say, they said. No defense, they said. Go to him. Give it to us straight. Are you the Christ, they said. I am, he said. Enough said. As the guards struck him, stripped him and spat on him. Bang! Go on. Prophesy you landed that right up, they said. Meantime, I'm warming my hands by the fire, trying to keep a low profile. Although there's only so much blending in you can do when you're watching your best mate and mentor get the living daylights kicked out of him. Hang about. I know you, the servant girl said. Must have one of those faces, I said. No, you're uh, one of his lot from Nazareth, she said. Don't know what you're talking about, love, I said. I made a beeline for the exit, but now she's got a captive audience, eh? Guess who he's friends with, she said. Thinks she's had a bit too much of the Merlot, I said, but they won't let it go. I could see them eyeballing me, working it out in their head. Come on, mate. If you're not from Galilee, I'll eat my own sandal on my mother's life. I've not even met the guy. The cockle crows a second time. And that's when I see him tossed around like a tear and share flatbread, broken, beaten, bruised, just like he said. And with a bottle's worth of red blood smeared across his face, he looks at me. He looks right at me, right into the depths of me. And all I can remember is what I said. They'll never deny you. They'll die for you. Three times you've denied me, Pete, he said. And I just broke down and wept. Well, that was just really powerful. It just mm. really helps to kind of put it into perspective and help you think about it in a whole different way. Yeah, it was really, mm. really powerful. Thanks to the Bible Society. We appreciate uh, you letting us use those videos. Mm. Um, we're going to go to a time of worship now. Um, good friend of ours, Earl Robinson. Um, he leads a church in Basingstoke. He's going to be leading worship for us today. And Al is going to be picking up this theme that we've looked at so far. So you'll hear more of that in the service but I'm going to pray and then we're going to go into a time of worship um, thank you Lord um, for this amazing story thank you Lord um, that you came and the crowd shouted Hosanna they praised mm. your name and Lord we want to praise your name as we watch this we want to sing mm. aloud and declare that you are our God yeah. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that you are ruler over all. And we praise your name, God of love and compassion, God of creativity, a God who is there for each one of us. Lord, would you um, bless the rest of our service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so over to you, Earl. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Earl Robinson, a good friend of Mark and Catherine's. And we have three kids um, who are roughly the same age as theirs. So we've been hanging out for many years. We got to know each other in Bible college uh, back in 2006, 2007. And Mark asked if I would come uh, today online and lead some worship for you. So we're going to do a couple songs to begin with. I know you've been talking about meeting Jesus as the one who uh, makes the difference in our lives. And, uh, it's also Palm Sunday. So we're going to do uh, Hosanna. Uh, praise is rising, which is what they sang that day uh, as he came into town, and then follow that up with Waymaker, because he is the one who's the miracle worker and the promise keeper and the light in the darkness. So let's worship together to these two songs this morning. Turn to you, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. 
we long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Praises rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all of our fears are washed away, are washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, who will ever our praises. Hosanna. Sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you. In your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. find strength to face the day when we see you when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are washed away in your presence in your presence all our fears are washed away presence in your presence all our fears are washed away they're washed away Hosanna Hosanna you are the God who saves us you're worthy of all our praises Hosanna Have your way among us, Lord. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord. Welcome you to each and every heart, each and every life. You are 
for just taking to us to a place of worship and we're going to hear more from Al a bit later yeah and uh, we're now going to hear from Al Al McNichol um, he's a good friend of ours uh, he leads Wheatley Community Church um, he's been and spoke in Lifehouse before but he's going to do our next in the series of Meet the Life Changer and he's looking at uh, Meet the Life Changer down and out um, so over to you Al good morning uh, my name's Al McNichol. I'm the pastor of Wheatley Community Church, and it's great to be back with you guys. I think it's been a few years since I was last with you, although that was in person as well. So thanks for having me here this morning as we look at 
Mark chapters 14 and 15, thinking about the entire sweep of what happened in Jesus's earthly ministry between the Last Supper and his death and burial. It's really interesting approaching this passage to think that it, it's almost impossible to get rid of 2,000 years of being conditioned as a society to think of what Jesus did as good and heroic. And it gets to the point now where it's impossible for us to have a superhero movie in which the superhero doesn't have some moment of weakness, some moment of sacrifice in order to be heroic. We don't have superheroes who, who just sweep through everything with never a problem because we can't relate to that as a, as a culture. And I believe that's because we have had century upon century of looking at Jesus's example and seeing that as something to strive for. But we only have to look outside Western Christianized culture to see that that is not universally the case. So if you look, for instance, at what uh, Muslims believe about Jesus, uh, the, the Quran teaches, obviously wrongly, that God would never allow his prophet to suffer and be humiliated like this. And so, of course, he was switched on the cross or before before going on the cross for somebody else. And Jesus would never have have suffered like that. Now, the reason it's important to notice that sort of predisposition to see this story a certain way is that we need to to recognize that for a Jew at the time of Jesus, this was not a story of heroism. This is not heroic, uh, continuing on and persevering in the face of persecution. What we read in these chapters is really a, a documenting of Jesus' total failure as far as the Jewish mindset is concerned and as far as the Roman mindset is concerned as well. We'll see that as we go in. So what I want to do now is, is just look at the various episodes and see how to the mindset of the time this was a total failure and then we'll think about why that matters and, and how Jesus presents it differently. First of all, we have the Last Supper. The Last Supper, Jesus teaches on what he's about to do and things look as though they are at least progressing to plan. And then Jesus's friend, one of his closest friends, one of his 12, leaves to betray him. It presents Jesus having failed as a friend. Just after the supper, Jesus says to his disciples, you'll all fall away. And that's then fulfilled. He, he appears to fail as a leader. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he can't even manage to keep his disciples awake to pray with him. He's then arrested. Uh, it completes the betrayal, but he's also seemingly a failure as an honest citizen. He's been arrested by the authorities. He's taken before the Sanhedrin, where he's charged with blasphemy, which seems to indicate that he's failed as a prophet. He could have been a sort of a heroic Jewish figure who the Romans didn't like. But the fact that the religious authorities saw him as a blasphemer implies that he's a failure as a prophet. Peter then disowns him. Further disassociation. He's pre presented to Pilate for trial and, and in that trial he's seen as a, as a failed arrested messiah, one of a long string of people who rose up against Roman rule. And to add insult to injury, off the back of the trial under Pilate, he's traded for an actual failed messiah, if you like, Barabbas, who tried to lead an uprising and murdered people and was put in prison, and he's traded for Jesus. Then the crowds disown Jesus. He seems to fail as a popular figure. He's then mocked by the Romans, and they fake honour him. They give him a purple robe and a and a crown of thorns, and he seems to be a failure as a king, worthy only of mockery. He's then flogged and crucified, possibly still one of the most humane, uh, inhumane methods of execution known to man. And in that regard, he's almost a failure as a human being. He's, in the words of Isaiah 53, so disfigured, he's like one from whom people hide their faces. And then to cap it all, as he hangs on the cross, <laughs> He comes under the curse of God, according to the Deuteronomic law. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Adding that, of course, to the, the crown of thorns that was on his head before, that symbol of, of Adam's curse on his head as well. So to the mindset of the reader at the time, this is not a heroic act. This is not a figure who is coming to the end of a heroic path. This is a path of failure. 
And there are two things in this text that bring us back to the truth that this is not a failure, but a triumph. And these two things are, first of all, that Jesus knows ahead of time exactly what is going to happen. He predicts his betrayal. He predicts his death. He predicts how it will happen. That he'll be handed over to the authorities. And in fact, in John, in the account in John, he says, nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down. That's in the passage on him being the good shepherd. So that's the first thing that clearly presents a different picture. Jesus was not the victim of some random miscarriage of justice, but Jesus chose to lay his life down. But the second thing is to see the fact that Jesus did this at the time of the Passover. And to dig into that, I want to look at the first Passover and just compare it with this second Passover, if you like. The Passover story for Jews was the defining story of their nation. It was a story of how God brought them out of brutal oppression and slavery. And they were in slavery to the Egyptian nation and God sent them a saviour, Moses, uh, who was going to rescue them. And he performed signs of power and yet he seemed to fail. Because the first thing that happened when he went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, was Pharaoh said, oh, you must be lazy. I won't let your people go. In fact, I'm going to give them more work. Things got so bad that the Israelites actually talked about stoning Moses. And as Moses then performed these works of power, there were promising signs. As each plague hit Egypt, Pharaoh said, OK, yes, I, I will let you go. And then he changed his mind and doubled down and said, actually, no, you've got to stay. And this happened so many times that it really seemed as though Moses had failed. So I want you to put yourself now in the mindset of a Jew at the time of the Passover, uh, the first Passover, that is. This, this is a time when you are being oppressed, you're living in slavery, and the hope that you have of somehow being delivered seems to be crushed. And then comes this announcement that there's going to be this judgment and there's going to be the Passover. It seems like the oppressor is just too strong, but this act of judgment and redemption on God's part is going to reverse that. What happens off the back of the Passover? Well, not all the Egyptians die, but the firstborn of all the Egyptians dies. The firstborn in the ancient world, the sign of, of your strength and your future. So the Egyptian nation has lost its strength. The Egyptian nation has lost its future. And out of Egypt comes this new nation of Israel, still in their slave clothes, but not slaves. And in fact, carrying treasure because God had told the Israelites to borrow treasure from their neighbours. And then when they left, they kept the treasure. They, they looted Egypt, the Bible says. And so this slave people still wearing their slave clothes are no longer slaves. They're free. They're carrying gifts. And they set out into the wilderness as a new people. And Jesus eats this Passover meal with his disciples and he frames everything that is going to come in terms of that same Passover. You see, at the time that Jesus was eating this meal, the people were once again brutally oppressed. Now, your mind might immediately jump to the Romans, and it's true that the Romans were very oppressive overlords, and that in some ways the Jewish people were little more than slaves to them. But really what Jesus highlights is it's not about slavery to the Romans, it's about slavery to sin. A saviour has been sent, a saviour who has done works of power that seem like they should be enough to deliver, and yet it seems as though the oppressor, sin, is too strong. How do we read that? Well, look at all of these actions, all of these ways in which Jesus seems to fail. His betrayal is the result of sin, Judas's greed, Peter's double-mindedness, and his fear. His execution is the result of Roman brutality and a lack of regard for justice. It's a, a result of the Pharisees and the Sadducees' jealousy. Everything that happens to Jesus happens through the intervention of sinful people. And so it looks as though when Jesus is crucified there, seemingly, according to the Jewish mindset and the Roman mindset, having failed at everything he set out to do, it seems as though sin was too strong. 
But in the Passover narrative, that is not the end. Because what comes out of the end is not a time when there is no more sin. It isn't as though Jesus' death ends sin once and for all. But its back is broken. It's like the firstborn has died. Sin has no future and sin has no strength since Jesus' crucifixion. And what comes out of Good Friday and out of Easter Sunday is a new people still wearing slave clothes. You know, we still have this body that is subject to death and pain and suffering and weakness. But we are not slaves to sin and we bear gifts. So Jesus' framing of this passion narrative, this time of betrayal and suffering and injustice and death, if his framing of it as, as the second Passover puts it in its rightful context, a Jew looking back at that could say, this looked like failure, but I see how this actually points to a great triumph of God. And of course, what we know looking back is that this second Passover delivered us as God's people far more than that first Passover could ever deliver the people of Israel. Jesus's ultimate failure was in fact his ultimate victory when we see it through the eyes of the Passover. Thanks Al for unpacking the first part of today's talk. Um, there's more to come a little bit later from Al. We look forward to that. Um, now um, we're going to spend some time praying um, and we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer uh, over the last few weeks um, and taking a line at a time. Last time we did this, we looked at give us our daily bread. And today we're going to be looking at um, uh, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And uh, this really starts by saying um, God loves us. Um, it's unconditional. It's unlimited. Uh, there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more or less. Uh, he has an incredible plan for each one of us. Uh, there's nothing more he wants than for us to love him. Um, but um, we have been separated from God's love by sin. Sin is basically doing what we want in life. We sin when we break God's law and do things wrong. Uh, sin brings misery, pain and death. But the good news is uh, there is uh, a way out of this. Um, the penalty for sin is death. Um, we've all sinned and all deserve to die. But Jesus came to take our place to take your place, to take my place, and died on that cross so that we could receive forgiveness and have eternal life, so that we could have relationship with God, so we could love him as he loves us. Uh, we get to receive his love and give his love back. Um, so we can ask God to forgive us, forgive us of our sins, it says in that line. And uh, he will. Uh, if we ask him to forgive us, he will. He gives us a clean slate. He doesn't hold on to um, things against us, but completely forgives us if we ask him. In the Bible, it also calls us to forgive others so God may forgive us. The second part of that line says, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. If God can forgive us, then surely we should forgive others. If God forgives us, then we should be able to forgive others. In the Bible it says, we are to love God, to put him first, and then to love our neighbour as ourselves, our neighbour being anyone. So we are called to forgive others. If we're going to love our neighbour as we love ourselves, that means that we're going to have to forgive them. And, and not only that, but we get forgiven too. We get to receive 
forgiveness from God. So in a moment, a three minute timer will appear and uh, we're going to spend some time praying. Um, after the three minute timer, um, you're going to hear Earl um, sing another song so we can sing along to that as well. And here's some prayer points for you. Three prayer points. One, um, think and pray about who do you need to forgive? It might be enough to say it to God that I forgive whoever it is that you need to forgive. Equally, you might need to pick up the phone. You might need to phone someone up or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever it is, or go on a walk with them. We can now walk, um, we can meet outside um, and walk with people. Um, you, you, might, you might need to do that. You might need to say to someone, um, I forgive you. I'm sorry uh, for holding it against you. I forgive you from whatever it is. There's real power when we do that. It, it defeats something. It conquers something. I really want to encourage us to put our relationships right with others. Second point, prayer point, is confess and ask God to forgive you. Let's get before him. Let's ask him what is it that we need to seek him and ask his forgiveness for. Show, ask him to show us the things that have displeased him. The things that we've done that he didn't like. The things that we have done that have broken his laws, that we've sinned, that we know are not right. Ask for God's forgiveness and he will give it to you. And the third point, pray you wouldn't carry the guilt of the things that you have done wrong. You know, I said when we ask for forgiveness, God forgives and gives us a clean slate. But what happens is our human nature kicks in and guilt can take hold. And we then carry that sin even though we have been forgiven. And so pray and ask God to remove any guilt that we're carrying. Any things that we've, we've sought forgiveness for but yet we're still living in them. There's a freedom that God wants to bring. So they're the three points to pray for. The three minute timer will come up and then we're going to sing a song after that. And for those in Lifehouse, I want to encourage you, maybe there's something that you need to talk through with your personal pastor. Maybe you need a bit more help in a certain area or whatever it might be. Um, why don't you, um, or maybe even you need that guilt to be gone and you need to talk that through with someone and pray that through with someone why don't you seek out your personal pastor and do that as well so let's go into time of prayer
it's good to be back and we're going to finish uh, this last worship song here it's called glorious day living he loved me so we're talking about meeting the uh, change maker uh, jesus so this song sort of uh, just walks really through his life and who who he was as a son of god and what he did so here's glorious day Oh, 
glorious day. Thank you, Mark, for bringing us those prayer points. It's just really poignant for this week as we reflect on the cross and just ask God just to really show us, you know, what is it that we need forgiveness for? We have a really good God who is always there with us. Yeah, we can always go to him for forgiveness Mm. no matter what. Um, So let's do that. Um, Here's Al with part two of um, today's talk. So earlier on, we looked at how Jesus's time of suffering and death looked like a failure to the Jewish world and to the Roman world at the time. And we looked at how actually seen through the eyes of the Passover, it was quite the opposite. It was a triumph. But this series is called Jesus the Life Changer. And I want to ask, why does it change things for us to have a king who has been through this? And I want to look at two particular things, Um, Jesus facing opposition and Jesus facing hardship. There's different kinds of opposition that Jesus faces. The first is that he is seems seemingly overpowered by the world. The, the stamp of crucifixion, uh, N.T. Wright puts it like this. He said, crucifixion says resistance is futile. It says, we own you. We are in control. There is nothing you can do. It was a total demonstration of, of power over a subjugated nation. And as Jesus is crucified, it looks as though he's overpowered by the world. Are you ever overpowered by the world or do you ever feel overpowered by the world? Do you ever feel as though the Christian life has no place or the Christian message has no place because it's forced out by the evil of the world or the evil narratives of culture? Jesus has been there already. Jesus is also caught up in all kinds of political and cultural agendas, isn't he? So you've got Pilate wanting to uh, keep the Jews oppressed but wanting to avoid riots and he makes his decision to condemn Jesus on the strength of that not on any merits of his case. We've got the Sadducees and the Pharisees who feel threatened and who see Jesus as a threat to the temple and Jesus as a threat to their way of life and and in the midst of all of that Jesus is caught up in these, uh, these conflicting hidden agendas and he is a victim of them Again, his, his final execution is not the result of a, a justice process, however flawed. It's, a, it's the result of agendas being worked out in injustice. Perhaps you look around at some of the way that Christians in public life are treated and you wonder if you yourself might be caught up in those kind of difficulties. You wonder if speaking up for your faith at work might result in you Uh, receiving sanction or not getting promotion or being questioned over particular beliefs. Perhaps you see how the church gets constantly portrayed uh, in terms of what it's against in the in the media, certainly in the national media anyway. Here's everything that Christians are against. Here's how they're inviting over everything uh, when actually what's going on on the ground is much more about supporting communities and about seeing the gospel transform lives. That can be disheartening to see. We can be caught up in political and cultural agendas. We can be misrepresented as well. Pilate says to Jesus, oh, you are a king then, are you? And Jesus says, it's translated various ways, but your word's not mine. Or is it you that it's you that said it? Or is that what you've said? Or did somebody else speak to you about me? So Jesus is aware that even when other people are saying to Pilate, this is the king of the Jews, he's an upstart, he's aware that he's being misrepresented and he's keen to call that out. But ultimately, he is crucified as a failed rebel, as well as as a blasphemer, both misappropriations of his message. Do you ever feel misrepresented? Do you feel as though you're pigeonholed for what you say? Do you worry that you might be? Jesus has been there already. Do you ever feel let down or betrayed? That can be an opposition that's very hard to get over, isn't it? It it, it relates to our hearts. It gets right to the heart of us. Particularly close friends, people we thought we were standing with, and then we find that we're not standing with them. Perhaps they've fallen away from faith. Perhaps they've simply uh, disagreed sharply with us over something, and we end up going separate ways. Betrayal can be hard to overcome, but Jesus has been there before. If you turn to Hebrews 12, 
it says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you do not lose heart. And we can do that. We can fix our eyes on Christ who went through all of this. We can say, even if I'm not spared all of it, I won't lose heart because Jesus persevered and I can persevere. Jesus' example changes us. Secondly, though, Jesus changes our attitude towards hardship. You see, he doesn't tell us to go looking for trouble, and Jesus himself didn't go looking for trouble. But he didn't make it his goal to avoid trouble or to avoid hardship. And his word to us is not to make it our goal to avoid hardship. You see, Jesus' victory started by laying down success, his sense of justice, his rights, his social standing, his reputation, his career, his physical well-being, and ultimately his life. Like our victories lie the other side of hardships as well, it's so easy to be distracted by the endless and ultimately fruitless goal of just trying to avoid hardship. There are always more things we can acquire, do, change, be in order to avoid hardship, but actually that's not a valid use of our life. Some of the most fulfilled people in the world have been through significant hardship. Some of the greatest victories have been won off the back of great hardship. In fact, probably most of them have been won off the back of great hardship. We can distract ourselves by seeking to avoid it, when actually what we need to do is persevere through it. Ultimately, our comfort doesn't count for anything in eternity. What counts in eternity is obedience because of our love for Christ. So I want to encourage you to seek obedience and to seek Christ's glory rather than to seek uh, minimising hardship and suffering in your life, because that's Christ's example. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you don't lose heart as well. And in all of this, I've talked about Christ's example, but we have more than just Christ's example. We also have Christ's power. And this is where I want to finish. Jesus's life changing life doesn't just set us an example to follow. He doesn't just say, I persevered so you can persevere. I suffered and it's not below you to suffer. But he also says, my power is available to you. We read that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in those who have put their trust in Christ. We learn that the Holy Spirit lives in us and he guides us day by day. So as we seek to do God's will, as we seek to live like Christ, persevering, uh, holding out in the face of opposition, persevering through hardship, we have the power of Christ available to us if we only ask. So I want to leave you with this. Jesus suffered and died for something that was worth achieving, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross and its shame. What is the joy set before you? What is it that you are persevering towards? We can answer that on a very general level. We can say, oh, I'm, I'm persevering towards God's glory. I'm serving the kingdom. But actually, sometimes those general terms can cover up that we haven't really thought through the detail of it. So I want to ask you the detailed question. What is it in detail that you want to achieve for Christ? What is it that you are persevering for? Is it lives changed? Is it victory won in certain areas of culture or justice? Is it simply more people in the church worshipping Christ who previously didn't know him? What is it you're persevering what for? What is the joy set before you? And I want to encourage you to then run steadily the race marked out for you towards that goal. Scorning opposition, persevering through hardship and ultimately bearing a crown into eternity, which you can lay at the feet of Jesus. Thanks, Al, for taking the time to come and uh, bring God's word to us. We really appreciate you giving your time. And um, Al, Al kind of leaves us with a question there of, are we living as those new people that he talks mm. about, where um, sin has no more power anymore, that sin is defeated by what Jesus did? Let's... Uh, think about that as we go into this week. 
Yeah, and don't forget next week is our Easter, all age Easter service online on YouTube. And um, just have a think about who you might want to invite to watch it as well. Yeah, great. We'll see you next week. Um, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.